Sure. So I am a professor for computational behavioral and social sciences here at uh, TU Graz. And my research studies human behavior and new emergent sociotechnical phenomena uh, in the digital society through digital traces like social media data, for example. We study especially emotions uh, and collective emotions. For example, when people are sending a reaction to a terrorist attack and we analyze that through Twitter or, for example, comments on their standard. And, and we see that they are not having as insulated emotion that they share that with many people. We also analyze polarization and how the dislike across political identities is growing over time and how we see that uh, on how people write. We also study inequality uh, or how the internet is not necessarily making the world a more and more equal and accessible place. And, and also privacy. We also uh, study what are the threats of intelligent technologies and this kind of data for, for people's right to, to privacy. So my statement is that privacy is not coming back as we know it. We're in a lock-in situation in which there's so many people using technologies that share their private information. And with intelligent uh, technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., you can predict private attributes of people who don't even share information, who don't have an account. And that collective problem of privacy is what is a game changer. And people are going to start living in a world in which they, they don't feel private at all anymore. And this can have consequences for cultural values like risk-taking. Risk it can have consequences for mental health, like emotional disclosure with people. If you never feel in privacy, you will never really talk the same way. And the long-term consequences of this kind of new data fed society are yet to be seen, but I'm not super optimistic. With respect to privacy, um, I'm using the definition of uh, informational self-determination, so that a person has the power to say how their own personal data is being used by, for example, companies or institutions. And, and this power is limited by the actions of other people. It's not only dependent on the actions of, of an individual, because if all your friends are on Facebook and they share a lot of information and they share the contact lists, Facebook can make inferences about you without you having any power to say, I don't want this to happen. So what I see is that there's no efficient, for example, regulation or technological framework to prevent this from happening. There's, there's basically no inspection, no, no police that can really go there and check inside the, the, the machine how it is happening, whether it is happening or not at all. There's always some kind of layer of obscurity that will, will uh, block it. And I, 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 I see it as a problem that is not a technological one. It's a human, a social problem. How are we going to learn how to use the technologies to protect, uh, not only to get value, but also to protect people's privacy? And the darkest side of it could be, of course, totalitarian governments using this to persecute people. Uh, and we see that totalitarian governments are really open to social media because it gives them a lot of power. Of course, we use these technologies because they are extremely helpful. Uh, so the case of Facebook is a good example of being in contact with your friends, no matter where they are, just as a matter of a click. Uh, there's so many other platforms that are useful uh, for Google Maps to find your way and so on. If they are so relevant and so per pervasive in societies, because they are useful and we don't want to use that, so we, don't, we don't want to stop using that. Um, and the issue is that if everybody is using that, then the individual doesn't have the power not to be there anymore because they're basically sharing the data on that person. I see two alternatives how privacy can go in the future. One is the dark one in, in which we still keep on using these, these uh, technologies as usual. They start gathering more and more information on people. And there I don't think that education will be sufficient to protect uh, the next generations who are born inside this system. Because we're talking about some uh, psychological processes, processes that are rather fundamental. How you weight risks uh, to benefits in a social situation, how you want to disclose your emotions with someone close to you. And having an observer in all these situations can affect you in a way that just simply some education, some training might not be enough. The right, the, the good way that I, I hope it happens, but I see it's just a bit implausible, is to have some kind of collective bargaining process for people, some institution that is owned by the users of the platforms and has the data on the users. And then the, the platforms themselves, like uh, companies, they don't have the data themselves. They can only request it from this middle institution. So it will be like a cooperative of uh, users that is empowered to really tell how is this data being used, how the states can access the data and so on. Uh, there are some initiatives on that, but building this kind of collective processes usually takes a lot of time and a lot of effort.
think think about it as a labor union. So the labor union doesn't really dictate the law, but it has a power within the law to determine what can and what cannot be done or, or part of what can be done. And this will be similar. This will be the law can say that the companies who make profit out of this data are not allowed to have the data in-house and they have to request it from the owners of the data, which are collectively organized. They could maybe free ride and not use this, of course. But if they want to be collectively organized, then they have to request the data from this. And then, of course, there should be a decision process, hopefully uh, democratic, that decides how this is used and how it's not protecting also individuals. This could become corrupt and could go wrong, of course. But I think it has a potential to actually work. In my research, um, we tested how Facebook or other companies, uh, others like Google and so on, could make inferences on people who don't have an account, who, who didn't really agree to their terms. We use some old data, for example, from a platform called Friendster, but also from Twitter. And we tested how, the, as the network grows, with certain history of the network, you could predict the future information the network didn't know yet. So for the case of Friendster, for example, we saw that they could predict or they could improve the prediction of sexual orientation and marital status of people who were not users yet. And with Twitter, we tried with location. And the idea is that the people who share their contact lists are sharing those links towards the outside. And in the case of Twitter, thanks to the metadata of tweets, we can see who was using the app and sharing contact lists. And some companies took this seriously. Actually, Twitter uh, started asking, making prompts to users saying, hey, we have your contacts. Are you sure you want to ask uh, to keep them? But, but Facebook is, is being very opaque about this. You can see which of your contacts they have, but you cannot see where do you appear in other people's contact lists. And even Mark Zuckerberg was asked in the Congress directly for this, and he admitted that they make inferences on non-users for security reasons, but he didn't explain anymore. So there's a pretty dirty open door there. As, as an individual student, as a, as a person, I think it's important to interiorize that you don't really have power as an individual. Uh, our ideas and our philosophy in the Western world is becoming more and more individualistic. What can I do to save the planet? What can I do to make the world a more equal place? And this is a case like climate change in which it requires collective action and coordinated action. So I think the most important thing is not to be satisfied with your individual choice not to have Facebook or not to use TikTok because you might still be sharing a lot of information and the problem is still there and you might still be inside. So the first thing will be to seek how to do this with others and how to do this with others could be a coordinated political action, a, a cooperatives like this one, or supporting political choices that will actually try to make a reform and not business as usual with these companies. The question of whether we should have an account anyway, uh, because we are there. So that's kind of what Mark Zuckerberg says. If you have an account, then you can ask us to delete the data. Um, however, you can ask to delete whatever is askable to delete, and there's a, an improvement on that, but it's also very hard. Again, I cannot ask to my, my contact to be deleted from other people's contact lists. Um, so you can say, okay, this is lost, and then I, I choose to, to do that. But it's a, it's a common goods problem. So if we all do that, then we're going to pay the price in the longer run. It's the same as now. I love uh, tuna sushi, uh, but I try not to eat it every day because then I will never have it uh, in a few years from now. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, balance. And in this case, if we all do it, uh, we are going to enjoy these technologies for a few years, and then is when things are going get, to get ugly. TikTok is a good example. We're giving a lot of data uh, to a Chinese company, and then who knows what could actually happen the next time you go to China, for example.